All right, so we will go ahead and get started. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today for the Avnet Academy webinar on predictive and prescriptive analytics and road mapping. Um, today's presenter is Laura Squire, Director of Advanced Analytics Sales at Qubit. And we will go ahead and start. So Laura, if you want to go ahead and introduce the topics that you're going to be covering today. Thank you, Jen. Um, as, she, as Jen just said, uh, this is Laura Squire, and I work for Qubit, um, an organization that focuses on helping organizations implement uh, business analytics. Uh, we are an IBM reseller and primarily do um, implement IBM um, technologies, along with some of the technologies that, that Qubit uh, develops themselves. I've been working in the area of advanced analytics since the late 90s. Um, and one of the big things that I've recognized over that period of time is that it doesn't get easier. Um, and actually, with some of the new nomenclature and terminology out in the marketplace, um, being able to actually implement effective advanced analytics properly seems to be getting scarier and scarier. Um, so today, uh, the topics of my uh, session are going to be to introduce what is advanced analytics, uh, what is predictive and prescriptive analytics, um, and then focus on how your organization can get started or get greater value for it. Finally, we're going to do a wrap-up um, on the session uh, to finish up and do a QA uh, session at that point. Uh, with that, I want to pass it back to Jen to get a little bit more details on Avnet. Thank you. So Avnet Academy um, is part of Avnet Technology Solutions. And um, for more than 25 years, Avnet Technology Solutions has provided enablement services around a wide range of hardware and software solutions. Avnet Academy is a premier training organization within Avnet. We are an IBM global training provider. Um, with Avnet Academy, uh, you get instructors with real world experience. Uh, what that really means is that many of our instructors have experience deploying software and hardware solutions in complex environments that you don't have to settle for instructors whose only experience with these products is in the classroom. Um, also, we have uh, training through our in-house staff and our strong partner network. Um, we have a large services organization within Avnet that we utilize to teach our courses, as well as a, a very large and strong partner network, um, partners such as Qubit uh, teach our courses, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we also offer a customized training roadmap to fit your needs. So if you choose private on-site training for your group, we can customize the curriculum and classes based on your needs and the current skills of your staff. Um, we do have a global presence. Avnet Academy has a presence in countries all over the world. That means you can enjoy benefits like using Avnet training credits in different countries or have one education contact who can coordinate training for your employees around the world. Um, you can choose how you learn, so from the comfort of your own home or office. Uh, we offer a public class schedule, which you can see on academy.avnet.com. Um, we do offer private classes. You can uh, inquire about those, and we can come to your site, or we can um, use one of our training facilities. And then we have our self-paced e-learning options, which do offer hands-on labs and instructor office hours. So you can still take the course at your own pace, and schedule some time with the instructor that actually teaches that course and talk, talk to them about any questions that you might have. Um, and through our partnership with Qubit, we've recently added some new Cognos, TM1, and STSS courses to our schedule. Uh, you can find those courses by visiting academy.avnet.com and searching our schedule using those keywords. And that is all I'm going to say right now about Avnet Academy. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Laura to begin her presentation. Thank you, Jen. I um, wanted to start this session out by starting with a few questions that, or I should say, a few uh, survey questions that were asked in the marketplace recently um, by Gartner, looking at um, organizations' interest in leveraging advanced analytics and predictive analytics in their organizations. Um, one of the recent surveys was asked companies, what percentage of companies plan to increase spending on predictive analytics in year 2014? 
um, the number that, that was out there um, based on the survey re responses was 73% which really kind of surprised me that 73% of organizations are looking uh, to spend on uh, predictive analytics this year. And really what we're seeing today in the marketplace more than ever is there is a huge increase in the demand for uh, predictive and advanced analytics solutions based on the expected and potential ROI. Um, what we see is a lot of interest. We see organizations today starting to hire individuals like chief data officers or chief information officers or chief analytics officers where there hasn't been those kinds of titles being, um, being hired for in the past. Um, so you know, when we see an organization that's starting to um, leverage those kinds of individuals in their teams, what we know is that there's going to be a significant investment you know, from the sea level on down uh, to implementing analytics. However, what I want to say today is that the investment in advanced analytics does not require bringing in a data scientist or a chief analytics officer to be successful. What it does require is assembling the right team and having the right culture and individuals in place in order for the organization to be successful. So with that, I want to go to another survey question or survey response that I saw um, recently, which is what percentage Sorry, here I'm moving my slides, and I, what percent, what percent feel that they don't have the skills to make the best use of their data? And right now, according to the same survey, 60% of organizations don't feel they have the skills in-house to maximize the use of their data. I think at the, at the end of the day, the bottom line for what I see is that there is a big difference between what you need in order to be successful with advanced analytics and what you think you need. And, the, and really what I'm saying is organizations don't need to go out and hire a, you know, a PhD statistician or a data scientist or a C-level analytics officer in order to maximize the use of their data. Um, they just need to be intelligent about how to use it and use processes that have been successful for other organizations. And that's really part of what I'm here to talk about today. With that, I want to give you sort of a lowdown on what I hope we'll accomplish at, at this session today. Um, I'm hoping that today we'll be able to dispel some myths um, that are associated with the requirements around what you need in order to be successful with advanced analytics. Um, I plan to give a good concrete definition of what advanced, and when I say advanced I mean predictive and prescriptive analytics really is. And then finally, let's look at what it takes to be successful based on what or other organizations that have implemented an advanced analytics have done. To get started, let's look at a definition for what advanced analytics does. Advanced analytics connects data to effective action by identifying patterns in historical data that draw reliable conclusions about current conditions and future events. Now, the operative here, thing here, if you're looking at this definition, is connects data to effective action. Back when I started looking at this field and started working in this field, which was the mid to late 90s, um, the term data mining was pretty much popularized, and organizations that wanted to find patterns in their data were doing data mining. One of the big flaws of that was that organizations that were doing data mining were, were not actually then connecting those results to effective action. So they were finding interesting patterns in their data, but actually leveraging those patterns to have business value and business benefit was something that they were not really effective in doing. And, and frankly, organizations that are finding patterns in their data but not connecting that to effective action, I think they're doing research. Um, and one of, the things that what, what, one of the things we want organizations to be successful doing is changing processes and operationalizing their analytics. At the end of the day, what I see is that uh, just predictive analytics without some kind of optimization, some kind of change of process, which is what it makes, requires to become prescriptive analytics, is just research, and it's actually not going to get your value for your organization. It's not going to give you the ROI that you'd anticipated. 
So what is predictive analytics? Predictive analytics really means that you're using historical data and computing power to find patterns that predict numeric values. So numeric prediction is one of the most common methods for uh, predictive analytics. And basically what numeric prediction will do is allows you to take a look at historical observations in your data and estimate what's likely to happen in the future versus what's likely to happen in the past. One of the first known uses of the term uh, or the uses of numeric prediction was a term called regression. And the idea behind it was we can estimate the heights of the children given the heights of the parents. And I think it was something like the children always regress to the means of their parents. That's the term regression. So predictive modeling where you're predicting a numeric value um, really is essentially something that's been around since the 18, 1804. Um, and this kind of technique is not new and novel. Um, it's something that's been used a long time to estimate or uh, anticipate what future values are likely to be. In fact, one of the earliest uses was looking at how big a plant was going to grow given the sunlight, fertilizer, and water that that plant was given. If we know that information about that plant, we can estimate the size of the plant or we can predict the size of the plant based on those input variables. Those same kinds of, of, the same kind of approach is done today with numeric prediction. Um, the only real difference that we see is that the data sets that people are analyzing are becoming wider. So you don't have two or three factors that influence a prediction. You may have 50 or 100. And when we're doing numeric prediction, we may do things like predict how much a customer is going to spend, how long a customer is going to become a customer, what's the likely, um, what's the likely amount a customer is going to owe in back taxes based on other people that look like them. It's really predicting a number uh, for an outcome. How long is a particular product going to last before it fails? All of those are examples of numeric prediction. The next uh, application area or type of predictive modeling approach is called classification. And classification basically allows you to use previous observations of a known categorical out output or outcome and then use that to predict that categorical outcome in the future. Um, one of the earliest use cases of this is if I send a direct mail catalog to somebody, what's the probability or predict, what's the likelihood they're going to buy? So it's did that customer buy or not buy is the thing that I would predict. Did that customer churn or leave or not leave? Um, will that customer sign up for a cruise line visit if I send them an offer for it? Um, will a particular product be stocked in the store be sold? Or will that product that I've manufactured, what's the probability of that product failing? All of those are classification problems. And oftentimes when we're building classifications, we're building what I call a binary classification. It's really predicting either yes, no, true, false, on, off. Um, and that generally is a very, very common type of predictive modeling approach. This is also what's often used in fraud detection. Is that case fraud or not fraud? But at the end of the day, with both numeric prediction as well as classification, you already have in your data historical observations of the thing that you're interested in predicting. And essentially, you tell the modeling routine of all the input variables that I've given you that are things that could predict the outcome, the thing that I'm interested in predicting, what is the combination that's going to best get me that predictive value? And the modeling routine or algorithm basically determines what the most appropriate combination of those variables is in order to make the outcome. And then based on that combination, we can now apply that algorithm or that generated model to new data and get a prediction of either some kind of classification or some kind of numeric outcome. The next type of modeling routine, predictive modeling routine we're going to look at is called clustering. 
And essentially what clustering does is it finds natural groupings of attrib uh, finds natural groupings in cases and says that they have a lot of similar attributes, so therefore we should group them together. In this diagram you see here, I'm plotting a graph that's with income and debt. And I see that my data basically plots out that if I'm looking at individuals and their incomes and debt levels, there are essentially three natural breakpoints, three natural groupings in my data. If I'm just looking at two attributes, I can simply graph them on a graph and do things like let's look at those two attributes compared to each other. And it's fairly simple for me to find those natural groupings. If I start looking at many cases or many independent variables, and try to find natural groupings, it becomes much more complex. So for example, if I am interested in trying to look at and determine customer shopping behavior in my retail store, I'm going to take into consideration information about that customer's frequency, recency, monetary, but I also may take into consideration uh, you know, their, their gender, their socioeconomic status, the neighborhoods they live in, a bunch of demographic inputs about them, and even the types of products that that particular customer purchases. And all of those things may be factored together in order for me to find natural groupings of, custom and natural groupings of customers. And I might find some customers that spend a lot of money with me, but actually buy generally pretty low value products I might find one group of customers that are all females, but they only shop for men's items in the store, and they only shop twice a year. And I'll find those natural groupings, and based on that, I may develop new marketing campaigns or new approaches to um, how I interact with my particular customer base. One of the other use cases for clustering is actually finding cases that do not appear or do not group with other cases. And this is generally referred to as anomaly detection or outlier detection. If, for example, I'm looking at this graphic here and I have somebody's debt and somebody's income, I could actually have a data point with somebody's debt and somebody's income, maybe all the way down here where they have low income and they actually have negative debt. They have a lot of net worth. And it could be, depending on that individual's age, that the person's retired and that's why they're an outlier. Or alternatively, it could be that somebody is a criminal, they're making lots of income, they're just not reporting it, and they've stolen a lot of money, which is why they have no debt. So you know, clustering can find outliers or potentially fraudulent cases, or, but it also can find normal behavior um, that's just unusual compared to other cases in the data. Right? Let's move on to looking at another analytic approach, and this is what are associations? So associations are identifying events, things like purchases, website visits, even crim cr criminal activity that's likely to co-occur. And the idea here is that if we can get intelligent about that, we may be able to offer customers or serve up the right web pages, or better handle the crime, that, get ahead of the crime, criminal activity that's likely to happen. Um, probably everybody on this phone has shopped on Amazon, and when you click on an ad on Amazon website, you'll get a, uh, or click on an ad, click on a product in the Amazon website, start looking at the product, and below, the, below you on the screen, there is a little pop-up that says, Customers that purchase this product also purchased, and it will list out three or four other products that customers purchased. Generally, what we look at these as being is what we call product associations. These are products that are often purchased together or, or co-purchased. And organizations or companies like Amazon use this insight to help cross-sell more product for you. One of the early um, associations that was really widely, uh, widely talked about and discussed um, when I first got, started getting into this market in the late, mid to late 90s was beer and diapers or beer and nappies. And the old story told, said that Fridays after 5 p.m., if a guy came into the store and he put uh, diapers in his cart, he also had a high probability 
of purchasing beer. And as the story goes, the store got really intelligent about it and decided to stock the beer next to the diapers, and boy, did the beer sales skyrocket. Now, you might look at that on the surface and say, you know, that's kind of a reasonable idea. If you find products that are, you know, highly uh, purchased highly together, maybe you can lift or increase the sales of one um, if you put the products closely to get, close together. But if you think about what a grocery store does, a grocery store knows that, you know, products like bread and milk and even meat are things that are kind of staples that are probably all put in a cart at a given time. And they like to put those products as far apart as possible in the store. That way you have to walk all the way around the store in order to figure out what you want to purchase. I think the bottom line for me here with associations is that associations are particularly useful if you're in the web world where an individual doesn't have the ability to walk around the whole store. But probably, yes, less useful in kind of the supermarket or in-store retailing um, that goes on today. That being said, I was at a Safeway a few months ago, and the guy in front of me in line, he actually had in his cart beer, diapers, and earplugs. It's a, it was a Saturday night, <laughs> um, and I thought to myself, you know, that earplugs purchase, that's a, probably a cross-sell that wouldn't have happened all the time. But if you put those earplugs uh, close to the diapers, I bet you get a lot of takers. Okay, let's move on to talking about another routine. Uh, for predictive, and that is what is forecasting. Um, essentially, forecasting gives you the ability of estimating a future value of the entity given what the historical values of that entity have been over time. Um, so essentially, what you're trying to do is forecast out over multiple periods of time um, things like sales, things like revenue. Um, you know, federal government does things like forecast out what GDP will be. Uh, forecast out what the um, population is going to be based on what the population has been in the past. The interesting thing about forecasting versus routines like prediction that we talked about earlier is that forecasting actually can take into consideration a trend that's either increasing or decreasing, which means that the forecast can actually estimate values that have not been uh, seen in previous data. Whereas if you're doing a simple numeric prediction, you're going to likely predict only over the range of values that have been observed in the past. Okay, so forecasting is a very common routine for things like demand planning, um, and it's something that we have expertise in at Qubit where we want to forecast for uh, things like uh, expected sales of products um, that maybe even haven't been forecasted in the past, but we can take into consideration attributes of that product um, in order to build a forecast. And then finally, um, within the uh, realm of predictive analytics, uh, one of the other areas that I don't want to um, ignore is text analysis. Um, essentially, what our technology can do in this area is use NLP, which is natural language processing, to take unstructured data and bring structure to it. And that structured data then can be used as an input to a predictive model or it also could be used to report on common terms or events um, and monitor, for example, social media. So now that we have a good foundation on what is predictive modeling, I want to talk a little bit about um, what adva how advanced analytics works in general. So generally what you start out with, sorry about that, generally what you start out with is the historical data sets, information about what happened previously, either information for, from a, of, you know, what was the demand or information about whether you were trying to do a classification or a numeric prediction or an association rule. You feed that data into a predictive model. That predictive model will take all of that historical data and find patterns in it that say, hey, if you want to use these three or four attributes together in a combination, we can estimate that thing you're trying to predict. And then that, that what we call a generated model then can be layered with what I'm referring to as prescriptive rules to help you then implement that model appropriately. What do I mean by prescriptive rules? So for example, I worked several years ago with a customer. We were doing a marketing campaign, 
And that marketing campaign could potentially have been mailed to every person in the U.S. But what we knew as a business is we couldn't afford to mail to every person in the U.S. It would take us as a business and make us broke. What we were able to do is develop a predictive model. And then based on that predictive model, what we, were, what we looked at was the point where if we mailed below that point, we would lose money on the marketing campaign. Okay? So when I build a predictive model for things like did the customer buy or not buy, along with that prediction, I get a probability or a propensity score. That probability or propensity score generally ranges from 0.99999, which is highly likely to buy, all the way down to 0 0.00000, maybe a little one on the end somewhere, which means very unlikely to buy. When I'm doing something like a direct mail campaign, what I need to do is prioritize that list so that I don't send to everybody. I only send to those people that are likely to net me a positive return. And that's my prescriptive rule. I want to maximize or minimize my losses or maximize my profit on my campaign. Prescriptive rules could be a lot more complex than that. If I'm doing things like, for example, building models to predict fraud, I might build a mo one model that predicts the probability of fraud on a claim. I might build another model that I determines how many hours is it going to take me to investigate a particular claim. And I might also build another model, which is the probability if I investigate the claim, will it actually come to fruition and I'll be able to retain or get some money back. All of those models are then used together in combination with things like the staff that I have aboard, the skill set of the staff, so that which, which claims get routed to which individuals, so that I, at the end of the day, am maximizing the return for my models. So when you are building or implementing an advanced analytics solution, I highly recommend you both take into consideration being able to predict what's going to happen, but also being able to maximize the business, business, business benefit by optimizing the results with prescriptive analytics. So let's move over and look at a few application areas for advanced analytics. I know I've been talking about some here for the past few minutes, but I wanted to highlight some of the areas where I've seen a successful implementation. Probably one of the earliest areas for advanced analytics was in the marketing realm. And you know, frankly, when I first started getting into this area, uh, we talked about 85% you know, of all of our projects were for marketing. Things like, who are my best customers? How can I acquire more customers like them? Which customers are likely to churn? Which customers are going to buy? How much are customers going to spend? How long are they going to stay customers? All of those factors are really marketing factors for organizations where if they can get this insight and they can do better than how they've been doing today, their customers reduce, or their, the business reduces costs of running the overall business and interacting with the customers, but also improves profits by getting the customers to spend more or stay with you longer. All right? One of the areas that's really a, an approaching or emerging area for advanced analytics is in the area of healthcare. Um, I used to work for Department of Veterans Affairs, Veterans Health Administration back in the early to mid-90s. And uh, one of the things the VHA was doing was funding a lot of research into trying to figure out what's the, what's the best way that we can maximize outcomes for our patients. Um, and I say reach research, um, and that's what a lot of organizations were doing um, in that time period. But what we're doing today in the healthcare area is we're actually figuring out not just you know, what gives the people the best outcomes, but how can we change processes and maximize our interactions with our patients, um, figure out which patients we should intervene with in order to not just do disease management once the patient already gets sick, but to do, to do disease prevention, which is uh, saving that particular patient from getting sick altogether. And because of the Affordable Care Act, and because of some of the changes of the way that the healthcare providers get paid, figuring out not just how to um, you know, manage diabetes or manage you know, cardiovascular disease once a patient already has it, that's not going to maximize or I should say, that's not going to minimize costs of taking care of that patient. But figuring out how to get in there early and prevent that patient from getting sick 
is something that's going to be a big win for healthcare providers when they start getting paid, not based on the procedures that they deliver, but based on the patient as a whole. The next area within healthcare that's um, particularly interesting for me is doing things like predicting patients that are going to readmit to the hospital, which is something that hospitals today are starting to be penalized on um, with, that have high readmission rates, or alternatively trying to figure out um, which patients have a high probability of an inappropriate emergency department admission um, where if we intervened, we could get that patient the right kind of treatment and minimize the cost for that patient. A couple other areas that I think are particularly interesting. Um, Qubit is specializing with many of our customers in the operations side of advanced analytics. Um, we're working with a number of customers doing things like, how do I better anticipate demand? Um, how do I maintain the quality of the products that I um, are cur am currently delivering? And also, how do I figure out ahead of time that a product is, is likely to fail and fix that product before it does fail so that I can maximize the uptime? Okay? A couple of other areas I'm going to mention here, one is human resources, doing things like figuring out which are the best employees, figuring out you know, how do we retain good employees, um, and also who to recruit and promote um, are big areas and organizations where there's extremely high costs. And then finally, insurance and risk. And this is, again, an area where predictive analytics has been used for a good amount of time, advanced analytics as well. Um, and it's an area where I've done quite a bit of work, and that's the insurance and risk area, um, detecting fraud, detecting risk, um, doing things like forecasting expected revenue, and then um, testing to see what factors are influencing it, and figuring out how to mitigate you know, an a expected decrease in revenue uh, by changing processes. And then finally, doing things like pricing products. Right? So I, I give, I, hopefully I've painted a broad picture here uh, this afternoon of all the application areas where advanced analytics can be used and I get, I've gotten a good baseline definition. Um, I want to uh, close this session and we're section, not session, section of the conversation um, by looking at where is your organization today. Um, this slide is based off of uh, a discussion that Tom Davenport has shared on more than one occasion um, taking a look at the degree of complexity as, as well as the competitive advantage for organizations that have implemented advanced analytics. And what we see is that you know, organizations generally start on a journey where they're doing things like descriptive analytics, really just reporting on what happened or getting insight of where exactly the problem might be. Um, as they move up the level of, of advanced, uh, advanced analytics, the competitive advantage that they get out of it becomes much more um, valuable. So then you're moving into the predictive analytics area where you're forecasting what's going to happen or you're predicting what's going to happen next. Um, one of the things that I have to say here, though, is within, within the predictive realm, if you're just predicting what's going to happen, and you're not actually doing prescriptive analytics where you're making a change because of that prediction, you're really not maximizing the full value of the analytics. I'm going to step back a minute and talk a bit about a customer that I worked with several years ago. I went on site, sat down with the customer, and they said, oh, yeah, well, we're doing churn models. I said, great. Show me what you guys are doing. And what she showed me was a report, and the report showed how many customers they were predicting to churn this month and next month. And I said, that's great. Now you have a great report that tells you how many customers are going to churn. What are you going to do with that? She said, oh, well, what we do is we tell our marketing department that that's how many customers they need to go and acquire. You know, to me, that's not a prescriptive solution. It's great that you anticipate which customers are likely to leave, what would even be better is figure out how do you get those customers to stay. Or if you've determined those customers are a complete loss, then it could be valuable for your organization to tell the marketing department what are the right prospects to go after to recruit to make up for those customers I've lost. So it's really not just figuring out what's going to happen, 
but taking action and changing processes that maximizes the value and maximizes the competitive advantage in an organization. One last thing to note on this chart is that when I'm looking at advanced analytics and the competitive advantage, um, I sometimes will run into an organization that tells me, well, we're doing forecasting today, or we're doing predictive modeling today. And when we sit down and talk about it, they are doing a uh, forecast in an Excel spreadsheet. And they're using it to input budget numbers into some kind of budgeting application manually. To me, at least they're doing something analytically based. What would be so much better and so much more seamless for them is to have an automated process really help them develop an intelligent forecast, selecting from a number of different kinds of modeling approaches, and then rather than having to do any kind of manual intervention at all, maybe that, that those results get fed into a planning application where those estimates are surfaced and a budget analyst can review them, tweak them, make changes, and that information gets directly fed into whatever supply chain or operational system they need. So now what you've done is you've really automated and operationalized the analytics. It's not just one report that one person sees. It actually starts feeding systems and feeding solutions within an organization. So let's start by talking a little bit about how can my organization get started. And I'm going to reference a report that came from IBM um, in 2013. The IBM Institute of Business Value Analytics uh, took a look at what it took for organizations to get value or start getting value out of advanced analytics. What we really saw were there three primary components. One was culture, the second was trust, and the final one was data. And it's actually kind of interesting because I had put together my own straw man of what it took for advanced analytics success. And instead of culture, I said executive sponsorship and expertise. Instead of trust, I said funding and measurement. And instead of data, I said technology and platform. So it's kind of neat to see what IBM was reporting on um, and how uh, my thoughts married up um, with that reporting. So the first area that I'm going to focus in on is trust, or is culture. And I think, you know, frankly, it's, it's the most important underlying factor that's going to influence the success of the organization. Um, it's got to be a priority in an organization in order to be successful. It can't be a one-off project, and it can't be a person in the basement doing it where there's no buy-in from an executive management team to do it. All right? What I really see is how organizations are successful is when there's cross-organizational collaboration from multiple teams to do it, and there's some standardized project planning processes. The other thing you have to think about is if you want, to do it, if you want successful teams of, of advanced analytics, you need folks that have career paths. Um, I was working with one organization recently where we had a, a gentleman who was a good modeler. He'd been trained up and he had some ideas of how to implement his models, uh, was starting to do the implementation, and he was a one-man shop and a whole organization, and he thought, you know what, I'm not going to move up from here. This is kind of it. And when a new job came around where he, he got an opportunity to manage a team, he bit. Um, so, you know, the word of caution for organizations is, you make this big investment, you really need to make an investment in figuring out what your team's career paths will be so they'll stay with you and grow with you. Um, the other thing that really needs to happen is changing business processes. And I saw this several years ago when I sat down with a, a call center organization um, where you know, sales and marketing really wanted to start doing what we would refer to as cross-sell in the call center. So a customer called in with a question, service, complaint, what have you, and when they uh, finished the call, the call center agent would have an opportunity to offer a cross-sell of a different product. The call center had zero incentive to do any kind of cross-selling in their environment because the, all the call center agents, even the call center manager, were compensated by call volume and compensated by call time. And the more volume they had, the shorter call time they had, the higher they got paid. Um, so you know, one of the things you really have to think about is if you're going to implement analytics, how will your processes change 
in order to be successful. And this isn't just getting paid in a call center and making a change here. It's getting organizations to have aligned incentives to be successful. I worked with a bank several years ago where we had three different groups, you know, home equity, line of credit, auto loans, and student loans. And those three groups had no motivation of working together and collaborating for models. If they used each other's data, their models would have been better. But they had no motivation to even cross-sell each other's items because if one team was more successful than the next, the team that was more successful got bonus higher. What we're doing, again, is misaligned incentives. We have to make sure that the business processes within the departments and within the teams roll up such that organizations can maximize the value of their analytics. Okay? And one thing that happens is you've got to find an advocate or some champion with your organization that's willing to come in and make those kinds of changes. And that's really where the executive sponsor comes in. So, you know, executive sponsor that can come in, make analytics a priority, and change in business processes where necessary is extremely important for success. Um, I can't underline it loud enough, um, but, you know, if you have an executive um, that's really not willing to stick their neck out, is willing not to change processes as they need to happen, then unfortunately you might have an analytic project where the models are great, but the process fails because the implementation isn't successful. And the changes that are necessary for that implementation to be successful aren't going to happen. I'm going to take a look quickly here at the team that I often see um, as a team that helps um, analytics be successful. So what I'm looking at here are the roles um, uh, within the organization. So within the line of business, what I generally see is an individual who's a champion. This is sometimes the executive champion. This is some, but sometimes a champion within a department that says, hey, you know what, I really need to do a better, time, a better job of forecasting uh, or predicting which employees are going to leave this year so I can recruit the right number for next year. And they have a business need that has business value associated with it. Sometimes that champion is also the subject matter expert, and sometimes they're not, but the subject matter expert is certainly an important person in helping make sure the analytics team, which includes the analytics thought leader and the business analysts, are actually implementing a result that's useful. A couple of weeks ago, I was working with a customer, and um, they threw some data over, at the, over the fence to me, and they said, you know, hey, Laura, we have some data here. We'd like you to build a predictive model and show the results back to our team. So I took the data in, I cleaned it up a little bit, looked at it and tried to figure out the best I could of what it was, and I presented the re results back to the team. And the team looked at it and said, you know, there's three variables in your model that you really need to remove. Um, one of them is totally giving away the results. I felt bad, but I was really giving them kind of a proof of concept of what my model could be. They were the subject matter experts, and they needed to be part, part of the process to make sure that the results that I produced were really important and valuable. One of the big areas that um, customers like to do advanced analytics in is marketing and things like customer segmentation. Um, it is absolutely impossible to develop a good customer segmentation model without the subject matter experts and the marketers in the room. You're going to get a result that you think might make sense, but if it doesn't make sense to the marketing team, um, it's, it's really not going to be valuable from an implementation standpoint. Um, within the, the analytics team, we generally see an analytics thought leader and a business analyst. Um, one of the roles that Qubit often takes when we help organizations start on their analytics journey is we take the role of analytics thought leader and help them define particular modeling applications and use cases that are going to get them high ROI and high business value. The goal of the analytics thought leader is not only to help figure out what those projects are and design those projects, but also mentor the business analysts within an organization so they can be successful. At Qubit, what we've seen is that a lot of organizations that have business analysts with familiarity with BI tools, business analysts that are good at building um, reports and analysis in tools like Excel, can be very proficient 
um, SPSS modeler uh, users who can quickly build up their uh, skill set so that they can start taking over the thought leadership position down the road. So one of the things we often do is mentor with our analytics thought leader, business analysts, and grow them so that they can start designing their own projects. And then finally on the, on the back end, um, we have I, the IT team that puts in place things like controls and governance, um, and then also the IT team is often the data steward and, the, and or the preparer. Um, within our technology, some, many times the business analyst has what they need to have to do the data preparation themselves. Um, but oftentimes they do, do need to refer back to the da data steward who knows exactly what all of the data elements are um, to make sure that the results are what they should be. Okay. Um, I'm going to... The next area we're going to look at is the cross-industry standard process for data mining. When I talked about having business processes in place, one of the things I think is extremely important... Ah. One of the things I think is extremely important is to take into consideration something like CRISPDM. Um, the idea here is that you don't start out with a data file and start trying to find patterns in the data file. You start out with a business problem and a team of people that come in and focus on that business problem and really understand what that means and understand what the relevant data is that support that problem. Uh, the CRISDM standard process, or CRISDM, was a process that's been in place for about 18 years at this point, um, and it's a proven process that ensures that you're, gonna, you're going to actually think out what you're going to do before you implement it. Um, one of the things that's really um, very important for me to do uh, when I work on projects is not only think about what the data is, think about how I'm going to model it, but ahead of time, before I actually implement, Think about how I'm going to deploy those results, how I'm going to use them out in process. Um, if I don't think about how I'm going to use those in my organization, in my process, I may end up developing the wrong type of model altogether, or I may end up um, developing a model that's not implementable. Um, several years ago, I worked with some customers who were uh, starting a project to build some churn models. And what we found out was we wanted to predict whether a customer was likely to churn when they logged in and authenticated on their web page. And that sounded like it made sense on the surface, but we had two problems. The first problem is uh, that when they logged in and authenticated on the web page, I had very few actual variables available to use to predict whether that customer was going to churn. That was the first problem. The second problem is if a customer logged in and authenticated on the website, they had a much higher probability of being a customer and remaining a customer than somebody that never logged in on the website. So we had two problems with the deployment of that project that we really should have thought through up front, and in fact we did. Um, but, but it could be, I, I've seen many organizations where they start out and build the model and then they start thinking about it on the back end and realizing that the deployment that they were actually planning on was not going to work. Um, early on in my modeling project practice, I worked for a federal tax agency, and we started building some models for uh, looking at uh, determining which particular tax returns should be audited for business. And um, what we identified was there were some very, very good predictive variables for figuring out whether a business should be audited. But unfortunately, those variables were not transcribed. And if they were not transcribed, and I should say not transcribed, what that meant is at the time that that particular return got fed through their system, we could not flag it for audit. So it didn't matter that we could build a very good model on the front end. We could never score with that model on the back end. So I hope that kind of underlines the importance of thinking about deployment ahead of time um, in your modeling process. The next thing I want to focus on is trust. Um, and pr I really think trust and evidence of success and the ability to measure that success go hand in hand. You're trusted as an analytics thought leader when you prove that what you've done is going to yield the results in your business that it should be done. Um, one of the things that we see with our customers in doing implementations 
is that sometimes it takes a little bit of time to build that consensus or build that trust. And so you need to put processes in place to show that life with a predictive model or a predictive, uh, predictive tool is going to give you better value than life without that tool. And if you can do that, then the organization sees more confidence in the team and really starts giving them more and more uh, projects to implement because they've proven their value. It's not just, hey, use my predictive model. Okay? And then with the, with the measurement, with, with the trust comes the measurement and source of value. So that's really thinking ahead of time, even before you start modeling. As part of the business understanding process, how will you measure success? Um, what's the value that my organization is going to get out of this? And if I do this, what's the return on investment for my business? That's what's going to get your organization funding. And I really, if there isn't a perceived ROI, even a back of the napkin ROI on the front end for the project, it's going to be very difficult to start actually doing that project and implementing it. And then finally, let's move to data. Um, I have the bottom of the screen here. It's rarely about big data. It's having the right data. Um, one of my old coworkers and I used to talk about the law of the disappearing terabyte. I went into more than one customer where the IT manager would say, we have terabytes and terabytes of data. And when I started narrowing down the actual data that I had that might be relevant to the project, sometimes I had megabytes and sometimes I had kilobytes, and sometimes I just had bytes. So, I mean, <laughs> frankly, I know we're in the world of big data, and sometimes you work with data sets that are super wide, um, but really what you need is some data and realize that no data is actually perfect when it comes to analytics. I'm going to end this session with a survey. Um, this was a June 2014 KD Nuggets survey. Um, one of the things that I know a lot of people think about is when they hear advanced analytics and, and predictive analytics, you heard me just say it's not about big data, but you go, oh, but everybody else is doing big data. The survey, this is a June 2014 survey. In, uh, in the blue color, we're looking at um, this year's data numbers. And when asked a team of data scientists, what is the largest data set you've analyzed or data mined? The most frequent response was 1.1 to 10 gigabytes. So we're not talking about massive data here. And I think that that number is probably a fair, a fair number to look at. So when it comes to advanced analytics, it's really not about having massive amounts of data or waiting until your Hadoop infrastructure is up and going. It's really about having the right data to build more accurate predictions than what you would do based on just kind of business savviness. So. And then finally, one of the things obviously uh, you have to think about when you're implementing an uh, analytics center of excellence or beginning to go on your analytics pro uh, journey is the technology platform you put in place. It is imperative to invest in a platform that allows you to integrate the results into existing business processes. You really just don't want to have a one-off result or a result that in order to get real time requires you to hard code. Also what you want to be able to do is you need to invest in a technology platform that allows you to recruit the right people with the right skills, but also cross-train existing individuals in your organization that have business intelligence and reporting skills so that they can be your modelers in the future. So finally, how do you get started? Uh, what we see is a great path to getting started on your first analytics pro project is teaming with a team like Qubit who have implemented mo many models for many customers in the past and are, and are experts in advanced analytics. We'll sit down and work with you identifying two or three opportunities that are going to give you some quick wins. Uh, based on those two or three opportunities, uh, we should be able to take those two key stakeholders, so the champions and executive sponsors in your organization, and get buy-in. And then from there, really, it's developing the first project and kicking it off. So with that, I know I'm a little bit late today. I hope to have ended about five minutes ago. 
I'm going to go ahead to our Q&A. Thank you so much, Laura. And I'm going to unmute the line right now. So the conference has been unmuted. If anyone has any questions, feel free to speak up now, or I do have a few that came in while you were presenting. I'll go ahead and ask. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? All right. Let me um, go ahead and ask you a few of the ones that came in while you were presenting. Um, where can I find an analyst or data data scientists that can support our advanced analytics efforts, and can you provide recommendations for recruiting? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Always love those uh, double-barreled questions. Uh, the first one is, where can I find folks? Um, there's a couple of different ways. First, I would look within your organization for people with the potential. Um, there's, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the conversation, You've got folks in your organization that are business analysts today uh, working heavily with Excel or working heavily with uh, business intelligence tools. They often can be great candidates to cross-train into doing predictive modeling. So I'd look first internally. Um, the second thing is, is that uh, companies like Qubit can actually help you uh, screen candidates that you might have. Um, because, uh, frankly, I hate to say it, and I said this to a client yesterday, there's a lot of posers out there right now that have the title data scientist um, who really haven't done any real implementation, sadly. Um, so, you know, one of the things that you have to recognize is, is just because somebody has data scientist on your, their resume or even has a PhD in statistics, that doesn't mean they're going to make a good analyst for your business. Um, it really takes your business savvy combined with tools that, that makes it a success. Um, and teams like Qubit can help you screen folks as well as help you uh, build your own team when, it, when you want to get started. Great. Thank you. And um, here's another one that came in. Um, we are developing our data warehouse. Should our team take advanced analytics into consideration so that we can use it in the future? So, I mean, my answer here is, is uh, don't wait. <laughs> um, don't wait. I, uh, I, I joke sometimes with customers, and I say, you know, if you're going to wait until your, uh, your data warehouse is finished, you're going to be out of business because your data warehouse is constantly changing and morphing as your business changes. So don't wait. Um, but also um, take into consideration um, when you make the investment that technologies like IBM SPSS Modeler um, actually allow you to access data directly from your data sources, um, as well as write data and results into it. Um, and in fact, um, for some database platforms, we actually allow our algorithms to run, or I should say, we actually call and run algorithms that run natively in the database. Um, as well as we also do uh, do scoring in database. So we can, and I, for example, I was at a customer site a few weeks ago where we scored 200 million records in 10 minutes um, against their Teradata warehouse using the in-database scoring capabilities in SPSS Modeler. Great. Thank you for that information. And I'm going to go ahead and um, wrap it up. Does anyone else? have questions that are on the phone that they want to ask now. Okay. Well, um, you can see on the screen here, here's the contact information for Laura. You can also contact Avnet Academy for um, if you're interested in the training that we have available for Cognos PM1 and SPSS. Um, and I will send out this recording after the meeting so that you can have um, all this great information at your fingertips. I hope everyone has a great day, and thank you for joining us. Thanks.